a name that the open access transformation in the Netherlands, I think really something special is going on and, and throughout the Netherlands and, um, and rather large scale. Um, it's um, maybe, maybe the, the, the part that is in italic, leaving the subscription era behind. Well, it's a little bit wishful thinking and we're not that far yet, but that is what we should all aim for. So that's why I, um, I put it nevertheless up. I am, as already said, at Radboud University. That's um, um, one of the 13 research universities in the Netherlands. It's in Nijmegen, close to the German border. It's a relatively young university. It's, uh, we, this year we celebrate our 93rd anniversary. And actually the motto of, um, of the last strategic plan of our university that, that runs right now is, is change perspective. Change perspective, we, students that come to us, we want them to change their perspective on their life. We want them to influence us and us to change our perspective. And it certainly also holds um, for the field we're talking about today. So I think the motto fits here pretty well. Let me say a little bit how I got, got into this and what is my, um, my, my background in this field. So I am actually an alumnus from the Radboud University. I studied physics there, seems ages ago, and I've been a um, professor at the university for more than 20 years. But I have been away for quite a while, and from 2002 to 2012, I have been a director of the oldest Max Planck Institute, the Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society in Berlin. And so I started there in, um, in, on the 1st of August 2003 as a scientific director. And, um, and it was about the time that already the Max Planck Society was very active in the field of open access. And they played an important role in the preparation for the first uh, Berlin Declaration, which was in the fall of 2003. And in particular, one of my colleague directors at the Fritz Haber Institute, Robert Schlegel, played a very important role in that. He is still very active in this field, by the way. So the Max Planck organization and Robert Schlegel then, they, um, they, they were instrumental in setting up the Max Planck digital library in the way it is set up right now. They also already in 2003 started setting up um, Max Planck wide APC funds. The Max Planck organization has 83 institutes right now all over Germany. Coincidentally, one of those Max Planck institutes is on our campus in Nijmegen. It's one of the very few that is outside of Germany, Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics. So the Max Planck organization started already then setting up APC funds so that scientists from the Max Planck Society who wanted to publish open access could call on that fund and, and get their open access publications um, paid this way. And that's why also the Max Planck Society has a pretty good overview of what has happened over the years and, and how open access, at least within their society, has, um, has increased over the years. The Max Planck Society has also supported from the beginning several open access journal in my field, um, European Journal of Physics and, and, and other journals they have, um, they have actively supported. So then in, in 2002, my own university called me back and um, I am now president of the Radboud University. Um, the, the, the organizational structure at the universities in the Netherlands is slightly different from in the UK. I think in your system, it, it's comparable to a vice chancellor. And um, so, so that is my position now. So I'm, um, I'm no longer very active in science myself, but I have a very active background in that, and I'm now in an administrative function uh, working for the university. And looking back over these 10 years since, uh, since I got involved with open access, you might say um, a lot of things have happened, but still, right now, only 13 or 14 percent of the articles are open access. And, and so certainly good progress has been made, um, but we hope it is, it is going to be much better, much more, and, um, and much faster. And I really believe that right now we're on the verge of, um, of really new, new developments because there's more momentum now coming. And I think there's no, certainly for this audience, I don't have to say anything about open access. And if you think about this, open access of scientific publications, it is, it is so evident. It is not the question, of course, uh, whether it will happen. It's the question when it will happen. And it has already actually taken way too long. And it's clear to everybody that the outcome, the results of publicly funded research should be made available to the public. It's as simple as that. And that's what we all um, stand for. 
So in my new position back in the Netherlands, um, open access came again on the agenda and, and actually politics in the Netherlands played an important role. Our state secretary of education, culture and science, Sander Dekker, wrote in November 2013, so 10 years after the Berlin Declaration, he, um, he wrote a letter to a parliament in which he stated the goals for Dutch science and in which he said that within 10 years, he actually said in 2024, 100% <coughs> of the Dutch publications should be open access. And we should basically linearly grow to that, uh, starting basically almost from zero or from 10% and then linearly grow to 100% open access in about eight or nine years from now. He also stated clearly how he wanted to do that. He said, we go for gold open access. He stated this very clearly. And he also made it clear that this should be at no extra cost. That is, at least, he made it clear that there would be no extra money available. <laughs> this, is a, this is a typical Dutch solution. This is how, um, how Dutch politicians do this more often. But in hindsight, I must say, this was very smart. And it is very smart because it is more than feasible to do that without any money, extra money in the system. And every extra penny that would be put in the system goes in the pockets of the publishers. And um, would go in the pockets of the publishers. So basically what happened in the Netherlands with this letter in, in November 2013, it put open access in a different way on the agenda. And um, it made it also a top priority for university administrators, for the, the executive board of the universities. And I think, I mean, I, I have actually five points that I want to mention that are important in this whole process, what happened in the Netherlands. And I think point one is that negotiations on big deals with publishers, which you can couple and ne on negotiations on open access, good arrangements on open access, need to be a top priority for universities and need to be taken up at the highest level at the university by university ad administrators. It really needs to be done that way. I was asked just before when we had a coffee by somebody from Finland um, how I, um, how, what my standpoint was in this. And I state this very clearly. I think it's crucial that that has been taken up. Why is that? Very simple. In the Netherlands, there was this added issue that our state secretary put it on the agenda. So we had a responsibility to react to that and say what the, what the situation was for the universities. But if you simply face it right now for a research university like ours, and it holds for all research universities in the Netherlands, about 1.5% to 2% of the university budget goes to subscription fees. This is a substantial number. This is 1.5% to 2% of the budget that we get from the central government. Okay, we're research intensive universities, so that means about 60% of our budget we get from, in our case, we get from the government. The other 40% we earn, our researchers earn, from national funding and European funding and, and third party contracts and so on. But of course, library budgets and, and subscription fees have to be paid from this central budget that you get from the government. So from this 60% you get from the government in our case. And from that, it is right now at our university 1.7%. This is no longer a negligible amount. Moreover, this is a percentage that is steadily increasing. It has been rapidly increasing over the years. It is still steadily increasing. And at the same time, at least in the Netherlands, the amount of money we get from the government per student is declining. So it becomes very important. And 1.7%, you can still say, is that much? Is that something that the, the, the executive board of the university should care about? Oh, yes, they should. Because, of, of course, most of the budget of the university is fixed in personnel cost and other costs that you have. And this is a substantial share. So just for that reason, it's important. Um, it, it is simply, I mean, this 1.7%, the way it is, is, is growing, it, it is no longer sustainable in the long run. But I also think we really, as, as administrators at the university, we really owe it to our own researchers to do this. Many researchers would like to see something done in this field of open access. An individual researcher cannot do that much. They do not negotiate with the publishers. They do not sit on the table. And the researchers as such are simply not well organized enough. 
They are individuals, and in those communities where they are well organized, things also happen. You know all about scope 3 in high energy physics, where researchers are well organized, where there is an international consortium, and then things do happen. We recently in the Netherlands, or started from the Netherlands, but it's also worldwide in linguistics. Lingua. I already mentioned that Nijmegen has a strong base in linguistics. In linguistics. That's why the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics is based in Nijmegen. And um, so, so in, in these fields, the researchers can do something, but not in, in general terms. And we do not only own it to our owe it to our researchers, we really also owe it to our taxpayers who finance what is possible to, for us to do at our university. And last but not least, it is also very important that the, that the negotiations are taken up at the highest level at the university, simply because you do need the support of the researchers. You all know, and I'll come back to that, that if you want to negotiate, complete opting out must be a serious option. <coughs> Otherwise, you can forget about it. If you're not willing to do this, if you're not willing to say, we're going to prepare for a complete opting out, you hardly have to start, right? So you, you have to really prepare for that. That you have to explain to your researchers. And that is probably much easier and more directly to do for a president of the university than from a, for a director of a, of a university library. You have a different mandate. So I think rule one, I mean, take this up at the highest level at the university, that is crucial. And I, um, I, Know that I in, in, in 2014, so this was half a year after Sander Decker wrote, uh, wrote this letter, I, um, I actually gave a presentation on open access at the anniversary of the university where I had the chance to talk to a few hundred of our professors to inform them basically on the, and they all know this, but they don't realize them all in, in, in that detail, I just told them how very, very strange the subscription-based model that we have actually is, and how this system actually got completely out of hand, right? I mean, there are our researchers paid by the university, they do all the work. They do the research, they write the papers, they write them in the template provided by the publishers, so the publishers get it exactly in the right format. The researchers do this so they know exactly it fits on the four pages that's allowed. They have to fulfill exactly the criteria, how to give the references and acknowledgements. They, they do all that. Then they give it to the publishers. They do actually, the publishers, of course, then, then do the, they, they disseminate it, and they do more than that because they also um, make sure there, there's gonna, got a quality stamp on it from the journal in which it's published. You get a, a certification in a way. But also the certification is, of course, done by the researchers themselves. They are the members of the editorial boards, they are the member of the advisory boards, and they are the referees. Some of them get paid, most of them don't get paid. They do this all for free. They do this all because they want science to go forward, and that is very important and very good. But then it's very strange that when they want to have their own papers back, they have to buy to pay huge sums of money for it. The system is absurd. If you explain this to everybody, people don't understand it. The, the, the former president of the Dutch Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences, Robert Dijkgraaf, who is now in the US, he wrote an interesting article about this in one of the leading Dutch newspapers in which he compared this with a supermarket. A supermarket that sells produce and groceries that we harvest and give to the supermarket. They don't actually bundle it, often in packages we don't necessarily want, and give it back to us for prices that we cannot afford, right? And he also said, I mean, how, how can this have happened? How can it be that scientists let it happen? Scientists, they're not the most stupid of them all, but they let it happen, and that's the way it is. And we now have to fight to get it back. But we have to do that. Um, it is clear also, if you look at this system, that, that not much is to be expected from the publishers. They would like to keep the system as it is. It's a very extremely profitable, profitable business, and they have the least interest to change it whatsoever. They know, they realize, they cannot keep it going like this forever. And they will say to you, they also are for open access. Oh yes, they want open access, and they want to support science. But they have a different position in this field than the scientists themselves. The scientists are in there really for the science as such, to bring the field forward, to disseminate knowledge to the wider public. 
That's why people do this, this refereeing work, Prodeo and so on. The publishers, they have a completely different goal in this. They just want to make money. And it's fine. It's fine that they want to make money. It's important that the system is sustainable, though, for both sides. The system right now is very sustainable for the, for the publishers. It's no longer sustainable for the universities. That's why we have to act and we have to do something. And it really helps if you're clear about this and um, explain each other's roles and, um, and, and are clear what, what the stakes are at the sides of the university and at the side of the publishers. A single university by itself can still not do that much. So you have to form, this is point two, if you want to make steps here, you have to form strong coalitions. You have to, co to make coalitions with other universities with whom you sit on the same negotiation table. And there I think in the Netherlands we have a very nice and maybe unique situation, although I know a few other countries where, it's, where it is similar. In the Netherlands, I already said, we have 13 research universities. And, and we have the Open University, 14 in total. We have a society of collaborating uh, Dutch universities, the VSNU, uh, the Society of Collaborating Dutch Universities. And actually the presidents of all these 13 plus open, so 14 universities, they meet every month, every, every five weeks more or less. We meet at an, in an office in, in Den Haag, in the office of the VSNU. And there we discuss common strategies. Of course, the universities compete for some things. But every now and then, we also have a common interest. And there where we have a common interest, we try to speak with one voice to the minister, to the politicians, but in this case, also to the publishers. So we, we sit there every five weeks. We sit all together. And we decided also at the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, that we should really take this all together as a top priority. And um, do the negotiations, this was also always already done in the Netherlands on behalf of all university libraries. We were still doing that on behalf of all universities, but, uh, but the negotiations are going to be led by one of the, of the presidents of one of the universities, supported by the university libraries, and supported also by the office of VSNU, so this, this collaboration network. And um, so that's what we decided. We divided tasks. So Jaap Winter, he's the president of the Free University in Amsterdam. He's involved in that. Kuhn Becking, he's president of the Tilburg University. He's involved in this. And myself. And I got the interesting task to have the negotiations with Elsevier. Um, so we, but we, but in these different discussions with the different publishers, we know from each other what we do and what we go for. And we have the same strategy towards each of these publishers. And every five weeks, we meet with all the presidents. And then it is reported on the negotiations that have been. And we decide, are we going ahead? Or are we going to change? Are we going to accept the offer or not? And so on. And it was very important to form this block of 14 universities speaking with one voice. We actually, during the negotiations, we did not allow anybody from one of the publishers to enter the university. We told them, we don't want you to, to, to give seminars here or organize anything. We're just negotiating with you. And we will inform our own people. And when the negotiations are over, you can come back. But um, that's, that's how we're going to do this. And so it's important that we have this feedback every five weeks. We knew what the progress was in the negotiations. And we could then ask for a mandate how to continue um, and, and so on. Apart from this negotiation team, you need a very good communication and PR strategy. You are opposed to very big publishers that know extremely well how to do this. And they know extremely well how to influence politics, and they know extremely well how to influence other researchers. And, um, and so we, we need to make sure that we really inform our researchers adequately. So we had a newsletter every month informing our, new, our, our researchers in the Netherlands what the status was of the negotiations. And we don't, also made sure that we had go, good contact with politics, and not only with the Ministry of Science and Education and Culture, but also with economic affairs. Because Elsevier, being a Dutch company, they pay a lot of taxes in the Netherlands. So we got actually pressure from the Minister of Economic Affairs, even in this situation. It's very interesting. 
In the Netherlands, we teamed up with all these universities and all these universities together, we publish about, the researchers of all these universities publish about 2% of, um, of, of the total amount of publications worldwide. So this is only 2%, so it's a relatively small fraction. But all these 13 universities are in whatever ranking you look at, are in the top 200 of the, of the rankings worldwide. I think there's no single other country that can say that, that all universities in the country are in the top 200 of the, of the rankings. And so that means the publications from the Netherlands have a certain quality, and that's even although we were 2%, we, our voice was heard, and people listened to that. So you, you have to form coalitions of, of sufficient size, and, and right now, we, we're also trying to form coalitions with or, or other organizations. And it makes most sense to make coalitions with organizations that sit as such also on the negotiation table. The Max Planck Society is one of those. Actually, Austria is also very, uh, doing very well in, in open access, and they have a very good policy in this field, and also very many years active. Um, and, and so we, we try to form coalitions with them. And of course, it's also helpful that other university associations, like the LERU and like the EUA, um, support these initiatives. But, but it, it is in a way, it, it is very important that they do this, and, but, but they are not sitting as such on a negotiation table. So it is more worthwhile to form coalitions with other partners that also sit as a coalition on the negotiation table, so you can really Make, um, make sure that, that, that you discuss the same things. So the first thing is make it a top priority at the university. The second is make coalitions, which in the Netherlands, we actually spoke for the whole of the Netherlands. The negoti negotiations that I did with Elsevier was on behalf of all the research institutions in the Netherlands. Right? So, so this is an advantage if you can do it that way. The third point, extremely important, is know the facts. Sounds very simple. And that I don't only mean that you know how the submission works and how the peer review works and how the publisher system works. And in that sense, in my case, it helped that I had a background as, as an active scientist and had been involved in all these channels. But also that you know the numbers. And, um, and that you communicate and inform your own researchers about these facts and about these numbers. There still are, most scientists at the university do not know how much it actually costs, the simple fact that they can click on the PDF and they have the article in front of them on the screen. They have no idea what it costs. They do know what it costs when they have to pay the APCs to make an open access publication. And so there often is the misconception open access is much more expensive, right? Because that they have to pay out of their own pocket, the rest they don't see. So you have to make sure that you're clear about these numbers and that everybody understands these numbers. And there, the problem is really that the publishers, and there are only a few big players in this field, they are much, much better aware of all these numbers than the researchers. They're much better aware of these than the universities. They're much better aware of this than the associations. So this is almost an unfair battle, right? You sit on the table with people that know different facts than you know. And um, so you have to know about the numbers. And I thought I'm, I'm not going to show many slides, but I'm going to show one, a few more than, than just this one. And, and there's one slide from the, from the Max Planck Digital Library, which I consider so important that I think everybody in this audience should really know this and really should know these numbers by heart. And this is from Ralph Schimmer from the Max Planck Digital Library. And, um, and these numbers that I hear are very simple. And um, they used that actually also as a basis in, in their white paper last year. And these numbers, interestingly enough, are not disputed by the publishers. They agree on all this. They're just not so very happy. We also know these numbers now and, and realize what the situation is. It's very simple. The market today, the total budget that, um, that, that goes into the publishing business, scientific and publishing business worldwide, and these are numbers for 2014, Okay, but the, that goes in the publishing business worldwide, and it's all converted to euros during, uh, using the, the right currency rates, is 7.6 billion euros. This number is accurate to 0.1 billion euro. So this number is between 7.5 and 7.7. .7. Everybody agrees on that. Question is, how many articles are there per year? If you look in the web of science, it's one and a half million. 
but then you don't get all articles. And there are estimates what the real number of articles is, knowing from which fraction is actually in the web of science. And then you end up with an estimate between 1.8 and 1.9 million articles per year. Well, for easy calculation, let's round it off to 2 million articles per year. That means that the, the money that is in the system right now, if you take 1.5 million articles and 7.6 billion, that is 5,000 euro per article. And even if you take the 2 million articles, which is a higher estimate, then you have 3,800 euros per article. That's the money that is in the system right now. Are there people from Elsevier here in the audience? <laughs> <coughs> because normally they are, because they have enough money to travel to whatever conference there is. <laughs> and they, they go to all the meetings, they are present at all conferences, and because, because it doesn't cost 3,800 euros for them to publish an article, we all know that the APCs, this is very this is difficult to see in the bottom, but, but the APCs that are accepted values for scope 3 is 1,100, and the MPG and the DFG in Germany, they calculate with 1,250. But even if we would assume 2,000 euros per article that is needed to publish, and you have 2 million papers, then you end up with 4 billion. So there's a lot of buffer in the system. It's as simple as that. So, so this we should all remember. And this we should tell to all the publishers and all negotiations, we should start with that. And tell them these are actually the numbers. And tell us where the mistake is. And there is no mistake in these numbers. This led uh, Max Planck Digital Library, this is actually a quote from their paper, to basically conclude um, there is enough money in the system to make the transformation Ultimately, all subscription spending must be stopped and we must convert completely to open access. The main finding of this paper of the Max Planck Society is the, one, the first one I, I said, there's already more than sufficient money in the system, no additional resources needed, um, and actually probably savings are going to occur. And what you have to do, right now you have the 7.6 billion here, um, this per article. Right now we have open access volume of about 13% of the articles. Interestingly enough, 30% of the articles, it's only 4% of the budget, right? So that's, this, that's what, it, what, what the difference there is. And what you have to do, you have to convert from one to the other and then use the money for open access. And if you use 4 billion for open access, you still have a lot of buffer to have all these additional services, new services that you might want to have or might not want to have. And uh, it's actually the researchers then that travel to conferences and not the co-workers of... Um, of the, of the publishers. Let me, let me go back to that. I'll show that later. This is actually assuming in this calculation a 90% conversion, which I think is smart. I think if we look at how we can transition the system from subscription to open access, we realistically we should go for 90% making open access. A few journals will always be special and uh, maybe, maybe we, we leave them like that. It will be difficult to tackle, but for this 90% it will certainly work. And so um, knowing, knowing the numbers is crucial, is essential, and um, this is also how we started actually our negotiations with, uh, with Elsevier, and we, you said a year, it actually took um, almost 20 months to, uh, to negotiate, and 20 months ago uh, we started, and I said, we were sitting on a table, and I said, well, let's first agree on the numbers. Let, let, let's agree on what we actually pay you, and what you get from us so that we know what we're talking about and what it actually cost you and what it cost us. And this was very complicated. And um, well, these are the numbers for the Netherlands, right? So in 2009, the Dutch universities all, all together paid 9.2 million euros subscription fees for Elsevier journals. This steadily increased to 11.0 million in 2014. Elsevier does not allow me to show this. Um, this, is, this is in a way interesting because this is within the scientific community and I think it is very important to share this knowledge and, and to disseminate this. And um, it's going to be an interesting court case <laughs> to, be, uh, to be sued for telling the taxpayers what you use the taxpayers' money for. So in the Netherlands it, it went up from 9.2 to 11 million in these five years. This was the last contract uh, that, that we had. 
And this we knew. This, this we know from the Central University budget how much it is. What we didn't know is how much do our researchers actually pay on APCs. The publishers do know this. Elsevier does know this. And um, these numbers, the lower numbers, are from Elsevier. And this grows rapidly. So in 2009, there were basically no APCs. In 2013, it was a quarter of a million for the Netherlands. We now know in 2014, it was half a million. And in 2015, it was a million. It goes rapidly up. Right now, I would guess that the total amount that our researchers pay on APCs in the Netherlands is 10% of the subscription cost. Right? And, um, and so this means that, um, that the income for Elsevier changed from 9.2 million in 2009 to 11.5 in 2014. When we started the negotiation, we didn't know the APC number for 2014. That's why it's empty. We agreed on these numbers with Elsevier, which was a battle in itself. Then, the, the, the lower numbers are very easy. You can just get them out of the books. I mean, they're, they're, um, they have to open the books, right? And they're at the stock market, and you can just look what the revenue, what the operating cost and the profit is for the SDM division of Elsevier. And then you see that, uh, well, the revenues, they, they constantly go up. And the cost, interestingly enough, stay absolutely constant. From 2009 to 1300, there's basically no change. Of course, this is how they steer this, and, and so the profit goes up. It's good that a company makes a profit, but um, you have to look at the numbers here. We have had a lot of discussions that I, as a researcher, should not look at the cost and the profit in the way I looked at it. And I said to them, well, fine, explain this to my researchers, right? I mean, this is what I see. This is what it costs you. It costs you the same in 2013 than in 2009 to do the work. And we have to pay 25% more. I just don't get it. Um, so this is, this is important to agree on these numbers. And what you see clearly here, already you see the amount of APC cost growing. And, um, and so more and more people are now already publishing open access. And so we wanted to couple the new the, the negotiations for the new deal starting in 2015. This was the old one, starting in 2015. We wanted to couple that with clear statements about open access. And, um, and so this is point four, which is crucial. Couple negotiations on big deals with clear arrangements on open access, where offsetting, as I just described it, is the preferred option. The publishers will immediately say that this is impossible. Right? Right now, in our negotiations with Wiley and Springer, they're much further than that. Wiley and Springer are willing to go in this system, and with them we made really good agreements. We started the negotiations with Elsevier, and they start explaining to us that a global market business model, which is for subscriptions, cannot be compared to um, a local open access business model, which some strange, bizarre countries want. And most countries don't want. That's their statement. Right? And, um, but you have to argue that you really want this, that you really want to, um, that you really want to offset it, and, um, and that you want to do it this way. Then, in the end, when, um, when you are in the negotiations, I think in the end, it is very important to be transparent about the deals that you have reached. We have to inform each other exactly on what deals we have reached, on the details of that, so that other countries can learn from that and know what to do. We are right now, we still have not signed the contract with Elsevier. We have, we have reached an agreement, but the, the, the legal parts are still fighting about the last details um, about how, what, what can we make public knowledge. But I can tell you the, the, the big outline of the deal we made with Elsevier. The deal we made with Elsevier is for three years, 2016, 17, and 18. And we said we want to grow in open access from basically zero as it was before, 10% open access in 2016, 20% open access in 2017, 30% open access in 2018. And we want to do that without our researchers having to pay APCs. It should just be covered in the, in the whole big deal budget. right? And, um, and so if you say do this without paying APCs, you have to identify journals that you make open access. So we said we, we define domains, chemistry, for instance, 
and, and some fields in medical science, we define domains and all journals in these domains we make open access. You can easily do this. We, the Freedom Collection of Elsevier has 2,000 journals, more or less. So if you want to make 10% 10% open access, you al almost have to more or less have to make 200 journals open access, right? From the Netherlands, we publish per year 6,000 articles, and in these 200 journals, about 600 articles appear. And you know on past performance how many articles appear in which journal, and we agreed we're just following progress, right? So. So we, we select a set of journals in which we think 10% of the publication is gonna appear based on our past track record. And then the year after that, we open an additional segment of 10% and an additional segment of 10%. Elsevier was worried that it would lead to an increase in, in open access publication in those journals that we switch open access. I don't think that will happen. Because for researchers, they cannot just publish in another field. They cannot just publish in another journal. It is only when you're just on the border between one field and another, you might decide to publish in this journal because it's open access for free for you instead of in another one. But it will be a very small number. And we actually agreed that we will just look after the first year how many open access publications did then really occur. And if it happens to be 15% instead of 10, well, then we add only 5% in the second year. Fine. We want to go 10, 20, 30, right? This is, this is the basic deal at no extra cost for the researchers and it is covered in the whole big deal, which has a modest price increase of 2.9% the first year, 2.5% the second year, and 2.2% the third year. That's, that's the deal. That's, um, that's how we do this. And um, you asked me at the beginning, are you, um, are you happy with this? Are you happy with the outcome? It, um, it was a big struggle. Um, I would like to have seen more, but I think what, what we got is really good for science. And it is good for science because we, we are going to go open access in these fields that where already most, most open access is happening. So where our researchers now pay quite a lot on APCs. They will not pay these APCs anymore in the, in the years to come because these domains will be free for them to publish open access. And I think it is very easy for researchers. They can just look at a long list of the website which journals are open access and they can publish in those without having to fulfill any other requirement. They just need to be, have a corresponding author that, who has a Dutch affiliation, right? An affiliation of the Dutch Institute. It needs to be, in that sense, a Dutch, a Dutch article. That's, that's how we defined it in this, uh, in this deal. So it has been an interesting struggle, an interesting uh, process. It is interesting to see that different publishers have a different stand in this. Wiley is much more progressive. Springer is also much more willing to go along. Uh, Elsevier not. Elsevier, if you, if you in the UK or other countries negotiate with Elsevier, they will say that the deal we have for them, oh, that's special because they are a Dutch company and this is a Dutch deal. Of course, this is nonsense. They can do it with us, they can do it with any country, right? And. Um, and if they tell you that, uh, actually, they warned me at some point that I had to be careful because I better know how much taxes they pay in the Netherlands. And this is indeed a big sum, 235 million euro taxes they pay per year. And when I pointed out to them that that is only 12 times more than what the CEO of Elsevier earns annually, <laughs> then it, you put it in a different perspective. So you have to do the negotiations right. And we're really from really willing, and I'm not saying we did it right, I think you can still do better, but we need to team up. We need to internationally team up, and we need to tell each other where we found troubles and, and where we found possibilities to, to make progress. We from the Netherlands are more than willing to help, and we're also very eager to learn from experiences from other countries to see how we can do better. The, in the, the, next ones, uh, the next ones that are coming up, I just said, and end of March, I start negotiations with the American Chemical Society which is a learning society, but it's also not so trivial. So we'll see. Thank you for your attention.